Uh, okay, this is the, um, the January 28th uh, meeting of the Conway Select Board. Uh, we're going to have a joint meeting with the Finance Committee at 6.30 tonight. Uh, we're being videotaped by Frontier Community Access Television for viewing later by our residents and the public. Okay, first item on the agenda is our minutes for the January 22nd meeting. Yeah. Has everybody uh, read the minutes? Uh, Look great. Any changes or amendments? Even though we're back to Lisa writing down the minutes. Now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're right. I am an abstention on the yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Though I do have questions just from reading them. But, um. Well, okay, what are your questions? So, um, well, I wanted to know what, th there was an estimate from uh, Jan Warner that the health insurance costs were th uh, going to go up 3%. And I just wanted to ask more about what that estimate was based on, and is there anything? She, she has spoken to um, Joe Shea, who's the director of the Hampshire Insurance Trust. And so if we were built, doing budget uh, forecast for, say, Frontier, which is the same insurance system, the, so that, that's what I wanted to find out, like how solid is that 3% number? It's pretty solid. Yeah. So, that, cause, pretty solid. so it's not going to be 10%, not going to be 8%? Like, no. no. Okay. Um, and then the other thing was that um, uh, I don't remember what the other thing was. Sorry, that was my big thing. Okay. All right. Um, you're okay with the minutes, Your Honor? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes for January second. Second. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Okay. So that's a two zero to one vote. Yes. Yeah. Um, meetings attended by select board members. Bill. Yeah. The date of the select board meeting last week. Um, I could not attend. There was three separate school-related meetings happening at the same time, more or less. Um, a negotiating union negotiating strategy session uh, uh, followed by uh, a joint committee school committee meeting of all of the elementary school committee meetings uh, committee and frontier where we extended a five-year contract offer to Darius Modesto uh, who is now no longer the interim superintendent five, five years. We did, and that, that is, was, is that normal? Or so that is not normal. That's like a, that's a real a vote of extreme confidence and hope that uh, yeah. you know maybe we can keep them out of some poaching the poachers for a few more years than we otherwise. But you knew, I mean, he had, right, right, he's and, not, and, and he's just done so well this first year. Everybody's just very yeah. impressed with him. But the big reason was that um, it the cycle of his contract coming up at the same year that you do all the union. So what what we didn't want was if. If he leaves us and we're, you know, at, at the end of a contract, yeah. we didn't want to be in a position where we're hiring somebody new and we say, "Congratulations, tomorrow's your first day of work. You start contract negotiations with all your unions." Okay. So we wanted to break that uh, okay. uh, cycle, whatever. So then it had to be four or five years because you can't, by law, you can't do less than three. Um, so we decided five, and City of Boston does five, and City of Northampton does five, but we weren't aware of any others. But you can't do less than three. You can't do less than three. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's okay. in the statute. Okay. The job protection statute brought to you by the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Um, okay, so we went to all those school meetings. And we also um, uh, blue lighted the bond, the, the, the borrowing authorization that we didn't set it in motion because if you set it in motion, then the towns have to 60 days, whatever. So we set it so that we're gonna, it's going to be formally approved so that when everybody's regularly scheduled town meetings, um, if people don't specifically vote it down, then it gets approved. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, any so I had uh, right after our select board meeting last Tuesday, we had a conservation commission meeting. Oh right. And uh, and, and basically, it was a meeting to talk about what stand we wanted to take on the next amp project down in Southern Conway, and that the plans that we had gotten from Nexamp 
looked like they were in violation of um, of encroaching on wetlands, and and, uh, and and I'm not an expert, but even even I it looked like they were getting they were they were a possible violations, and so and and sometimes Conway does bend the rules a little bit if somebody is. Um, you know, building a project and then it's a couple feet off, and and you know the and and the the state when they review Con what Conway has done has always approved and understood why we why we would take the stance that we do, uh, but they, I don't think the state would would go along with it if even if Conway said we really like this project, you know, it's it's let's uh, let's um, cut all these trees down that are encroaching on the wetlands, and so. Mm -hmm. And so, so we at least voted as a commission that we're going to report that we're going to report back to Nexamp that we're going to take this position, which we've done now, and uh, that they're going to bring in a, a, a new set of plans in for us to compare them and go over with them. So, Did, didn't they have a wetland delineation before they? Absolutely, and the, and the deline delineation is fine. It's only a question of how of, close of, how, they are. of whether or not you're. Doing things within the wetland and, and and how far from the wetland? Well, doesn't the delineation include that 200 uh, uh, foot buffer? That's right. So yeah. So so they have something within that 200 foot buffer. Way within that 200 foot buffer. Oh. Uh, and uh, and 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 the motive. I mean, the motivation is clear, and I won't say the motivation is terrible. It's that it's that you need to cut down trees so they don't shade solar panels. And and uh, but but the trees and but, solar but panels are the, the, the wetlands are important too. You, you know. Yeah, so yeah. so so and, and and the conservation commission's job is to protect the wetlands, not to enable a project to build more solar. So, right. so at least according to what looked like all of our understanding, and and uh, of the Wetlands Act and and the talk that Bruton, the chair, had had with the guy from the state who went over the plans and made it pretty clear that they would push back also if we didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. And and you know and Conway is generally very protective. And so sure. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, so that was for me. That was an interesting meeting, and and normally the people come in and talk, and the commission works really hard to find a way for people to do the projects that they want to do. Um, but this is going to be a little more contentious than mm -hmm. than the other work that I've at least witnessed. And, and uh, anyway, so it was it was it was an interesting meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and I think it was Wednesday. I listened in on the um, the, the state's call about the school funding. Governor Baker has released his budget. Yeah. Um, I wish I understood school as, as well as, you know, uh, uh, as well as Phil. But uh, so that was it was interesting to hear it laid out. Yeah. Um, anyway, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one other thing I'll just mention that we did, and I know that anyway, is, is that on Saturday. I went with a group of people from FCAT and we bought a new computer for FCAT. So this isn't big news for Conway, but the reason is, is that FCAT is going to be doing a, a, a big production on a TEDx talk that's going to be done here in Franklin County. And, uh, and FCAT really needed more computer power to do <coughs> this, this TEDx talk. And I'm so excited that this talk is going to be, is going to be done out here. And uh, what's it about? And, I, I'm not sure, but, but as I learn more about it, we will find out. Right? But we needed more computer power in order to do it. So, so anyway, this is, I'll, I'll definitely fill you in as it happens. Because, uh, I, I love TEDx myself, and, and okay. uh, so it'll be great. Thank you, Robert. Um, okay, I had a, uh, a FERCOG Finance Committee meeting at which we uh, reviewed the budget and approved the budget for passage on to the First on council, and I had the council meeting as well, and the budget was approved at the council. Uh, we're going to have a slight uh, increase in our assessment, uh, primarily because of uh, our EQV is up a little bit. Your what? Our EQV. What's that? A little bit. That's our that's our our valuation. 
in town. Okay, and, and part of the assessment is based on the valuation. Okay. EQV. Yeah. Equalized. Uh, okay. Equalized something value. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So, and what is a little bit? Was going up a little bit? Um, I don't have that figure, exact figure. It's, it's probably going to be somewhere around the thousand, fourteen hundred dollars, somewhere. In there. That's not not that big. Of a deal. That seems like a very little bit. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. So that's what that's what I was at uh, last week. Okay. Uh, public, public comments. We have any public comments? I don't see any public here, so we don't have any public comments. Old business. Um, review the direct local and technical assistant priorities for the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Tom. Well, I can tell you what I have compiled so far. Okay. Which came from the planning board. Okay. And you and me. Okay. So this is so far. Um, we have uh, three planning projects. You're supposed to rank top three to five. And uh, the planning board had asked for um, under the housing planning and implementation, uh, they had uh, asked for a, a housing needs assessment. Um, so I put that as one. Uh, you'd had culvert assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two, and uh, they have they have some work on that done already, uh, by the way. And uh, three, the, the planning board had also asked for managing flood risks through regional collaboration. So as to participate in a watershed advisory council. So presumably that would be somebody from the planning board that would uh, that would do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that was that one in the regional area, not in the. No, that was in planning. Uh, was in planning. It was in planning. Um, under regional. Um, so that would be just us in Nashville. Maybe Deerfield too, or who else is? Well, yeah, that that um, is. Are we talking specifically about the South River on that? Well, they put this out to the whole county. Yeah. So I think there will probably be things that. Um, will be similar between communities that they might be able to focus on. For instance, um, one of the things they've been working on is river uh, river corridor planning, mm -hmm. where you don't look at just where the river is, but where it has been in the past, and you and you try to have some. Now, now we've already had that done on the South River for us, if, if I'm not mistaken. Kimberly, we, we had a study done. We, yeah. didn't, we haven't taken any actions about it. And the next step would be to develop uh, zoning bylaws around that. Yeah, but Kimberly did give us a presentation where she outlined Oh yeah. Outline those. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I mentioned it, is they've done some preliminary work for that, but then the question is, what do you do about it? Okay. And I think that's what this is. Well, that's what the rose field, the, the, the river work on the rose field was based on uh, that yes, stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, then under, uh, under regional projects, um, the, uh, both the planning board and John had asked for some zoning bylaw development. Um, so I put that down as number one. Then um, continuing their local official continuing education workshops as to um, explore feasibility or continue work to establish new shared services. Uh, we're interested both in human resources management and um, a shared town risk manager or OSHA compliance officer. That's a that's a new. Uh, it's going to hit some towns hard, but they have to pay to be OSHA compliant. And yeah. We might be one of those towns. Yeah. See, I, I don't know about that last week. Just from my past experience hiring that same type of consultancy for the Frontier District to study things like regionalization among the towns, what we discovered is that nobody, no outside person can know your town better than you do. And that we're just better off sitting down ourselves and just talking about it. And that the, well, the, the, yeah, this is consultancies the study. are big dollars. This is not a study that you're, we're talking about. This is not a consultant. We're actually talking about a shared compliance officer for multiple towns. So they're talking about hiring somebody. And them funding it. 
Yeah, through us. <laughs> but yes. Okay. Um, and the same for uh, human resources management. Though again, I'm also uh, writing that community compact grant for a study about the frontier region. Uh, then also, um, both John and I had an, uh, getting some help on abandoned properties. And so an abandoned properties task force. There are various ways they can be approached. A lot of ours are problematic because people are actually still paying taxes. So that's technically not abandoned. But and, and there are, it gets tricky dealing with it after that. So that was the original project. Oh, I'm sorry. There were uh, we get two more. There are three more possibilities. Um, one of them is uh, foster municipal engagement and involvement. Consider how towns can plan and prepare for re retirements of long-term public servants in key municipal positions. Uh, this is uh, succession planning. Citizens Academy, participation in career fairs and expos, etc. Uh, we don't have a very deep bench here in Conway, so I think that's why John and I came up with that independently as our as a. As a I thought the abandoned properties was under planning and not regional. Just uh, but just reading what I, I understand. Reading what I've got here. Yeah. Um, and uh, then a regional opioid task force uh, support the regional efforts. Uh, with a specific focus on municipal action steps. What can we do in this town? Um, that leaves, that's five. Um, and uh, John, I was hoping you would be willing to, uh, for this, um, at this juncture, to uh, drop the development of municipal emergency response toolkit and trainings. I think that um, we may be ready for a uh, staff <coughs> position on that. And I think okay. we may find some more energy and um, uh, uh, attention to bringing our own emergency management team together uh, in the near future. Okay. I'm yeah. hoping that's the drop, case. Drop that. Okay. Um, we got a deep bench on that in town now. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then uh, under community compact projects, um, I know they're working on an accountant accounting training program that they're applying for, so I put that down. <coughs> and uh, I also um, know that they're considering updating the Franklin Regional Sustainability Plan, so I just put that down as, mm -hmm. yeah, you should go ahead and do that. That's gonna be their own community compact project, but you should would support it. So that actually brings us in um, below the level of things we could ask for, so if anybody has any additions, that would be okay, but, uh, so I had a project that I was that I was wondering if anybody else would support, but but basically earlier we had talked to the FERCOC had talked to us about some training f uh, for uh, DPW people about how to how to manage pollinator. Uh, oh yes. Uh, uh, health, you know how to how to deal with roads and salt and. And cutting oh, back pollen rush. pollinator habitat and, corridor, and and, it, and then one of these projects was different. So one of these projects went uh, along with that. That what they had talked to us about before was oh, a training, a training for the DP. Right, but but so that I really like the fact that one of these is the pollinator habitat corridor, and and what it reminds me of is that you know Tony Borton has done a lot of work in in, in working with I think it's uh, the Extension Service on establishing how his land connects to other land to create a pollinator corridor and a whole and an animal corridor up through his property and it just seemed like that would be a good study for us to do well we've got we've got plenty of room in that uh, oh, we do under planning project so I and didn't know if there's any I, just, I yeah. just booked as the speaker for the historical society in May the gentleman that coined the term pollinator corridor yeah and, and has done all of the research establishing the bio whatever <laughs> that uh, he's a Harvard guy well, well, it looks like we have uh, tremendous support for this. So, yeah, let's put that down, Tom. So, um, and the other, I, I mean, I, I was just yeah. thinking that we're, um, I would, I would just like to see more services towards our seniors. Um, I, like, I, I think the one thing that I hear that we don't offer anything is sort of the uh, digital training, uh, any opportunity for um, within Con in Conway to train or to sit down with the seniors and have them more digitally uh, 
uh, there's a term knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but there, there, there's work, there, there are workshops available that for people that come in and do senior workshops on digital. Do, do, does FERCOG have anything like that for seniors? Yeah, they should. They, they have some projects for seniors. Senior but digital literacy. Uh huh. Senior uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Digital. Uh, okay. I've seen something like that around, kicking around there. Just, you know, maybe I, you can, I will. I will ask about that. Maybe you can ask um, Pat Lynch. Is, is she still the the, uh, yeah, yeah. the chair of, of the COA? Yeah, right? I'm I, sure I'll, she she knows there there may be um, you know other senior um, centers around that that have that kind of. Uh, yeah, or maybe training. the library can, can do something. Too. Sure. Yeah. I'll I'll ask around. Okay. Yeah, that, that's important. Okay, and, and they do ask for a context for the project, so um, uh, I'm going to put Bob down for the pollinator habitat, the planning board down for uh, um, all the planning board things. There was um, one project that I thought that the I zoning can, board might ask about, and that was a project about marijuana zoning. Yeah. And yeah, that, that came under um, that came under zoning bylaw development. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's actually got a, a series of things in it. Okay, thank you, Tom. You're welcome. All right, under new business, um, we have a joint meeting with the finance committee. Come on, boys. Come on. Come to the table. And we have a, uh, a fiscal 2020 budget review with the Franklin County Technical School. Gentlemen, come on up, take the hot seat over here. Hot seat over here. We have a screen, but if you want to set it up over there, that, that's yeah, 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 Past yet. That goes next uh, to yeah, the budget yeah. hearing at the tech school is the. So all we can show you is what hasn't been approved. That's <laughs> right. I like draft. Yes. Every bit of it. Yeah. At this time of year, unfortunately, that seems to be the that seems to be the way it goes. <clears throat> Be up and running within a minute. I'll put this back. Don't walk me on it. <laughs> <laughs> Introductions, Russ Gobras, business manager, Franklin County Tech School, and Rick Martin, the superintendent, Franklin County Tech. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we do to try to get out before the town meeting is have an opportunity to um, share with you where we are in the budget building process, how it's going to impact Conway, mm -hmm. what's our projected enrollment for next year for Conway, so you get the budget ahead of time, what's it currently, what's been our trend. So you're gonna see some of that, but it's also important for you to understand 
some of the things that we're doing with the current revenues that we are currently having. This thing keeps popping up a Wi-Fi, and I don't want it. So I should just turn off my Wi-Fi, and that will eliminate that problem, because I don't need Wi-Fi. Yeah, I'll turn that right off. All right, go right back to here. Where'd that Wi-Fi go? There we go. <laughs> All right. So, um, during the past fiscal year, um, we had an increase in participation in passing scores with advanced placement courses to the point that it got nationally recognized. We were one of 18 schools in Massachusetts that improved um, the most with our AP, and we were recognized as one of 18 school districts and got um, some accolades from the Advanced Placement Center. With that being said, um, we increased our Tech Connect program, which is for grades five, six, and seven during the eighth grade, we increased, um, well, we actually share with Irving. We had a 1.0 music teacher retire, and they had a part-time teacher that might have left the district, so we collaborated with them, and we shared the teachers. So now we went to 0 0.5, and now they got a 0 0.5. So we're trying to constantly look at ways to try to be able to share resources with other communities. We have a half-time Spanish instructor. That's a lot more to do a conversational Spanish, so when they're out on the job site, they can understand a tiny bit more. Uh, we have a 0.5 health course and a 0.5 special education math position, as well as our credit recovery. Um, those are the additions that we have done in the last year to accommodate and um, our student population. So with our half-time positions, when you take away the full-time positions we used to have, it all balanced out. This is just a creative way to be able to offer students a little bit more. So basically that one music teacher who retired and we went to point five allowed us to go to half-time Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. We, in the last year, we have um, had our cooperative education program increase, and that's dramatic because this year we have 56% of our seniors out on paid co-op jobs or internships. Mm -hmm. That's more than half of our senior that's class. That's, mm -hmm. that's impressive because they're going out to the communities in which they live and they're able to give back a little bit. Um, some of the other things that we have been able to do is we needed to have a vocational special education support person for the vocational shops to accommodate the increase in IEPs. And I'll show a little bit later about what that is. Um, we did finish our first house project, and that's right here. We did that in Irving, and the students, we have a relationship, a 5013C with the Greenfield Savings Bank, and basically we take the, the profits from this house, and it goes to the next lot, and then building supplies, and we keep it going for people in the community. So it could come to our house anyway. We could be doing one out here as well. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on... Um, what they're able to find for property. What do you mean your first one? I mean, well, in the past, houses before. But first one on our own, because right. it's been 20 some odd years or before I even You built a great house before. in Conway, right, you know, right down yep. the street from me. Yep. How many years ago? Uh, it was a while ago. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so what we were doing for a bunch of years is Habitat, Habitat for Humanity houses. Um, <laughs> we did a handful of those. So we didn't really have one that we were running on our own. Oh, and you're right. Yeah, so, so this yeah, is the first time we actually did it from soup to nuts ourselves. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting for the students to be exposed to that because you know they're going to real. They are going to learn real life skills that they can apply when they go out onto the job sites. We've revamped our welding shop uh, program. We have new. You know, we have an old building, comparably speaking, to other vocational technical schools. It hasn't changed since it's been built in 1976. So we do have new windows and doors and parking lot lights and things like that. We saved hundreds of thousands of dollars by our students doing a lot of that work. You know, they, they dug the conduits, they laid the wire, they put the parking lights in there, they did the same for the football field and for the basketball court. So they saved us a lot of money to be able to do that. You know, Frontier is doing a lot of work at Frontier. Yeah. Maybe. It, 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 it's fun to see the kids out there. Yeah. Um, so aside from the house, um, we wrote a $500,000 grant to get new welding equipment, uh, equipment. So we got that approved. We are actually going to have a ribbon cutting ceremony sometime at the end of February, beginning of March. Uh, it's all we increased our footprint by 1,500 square feet of space. 
we added a half a dozen brand new computer numerical control welding machines to get our kids to have those kind of skills when they go out in the real world. And uh, so some of the things that we were able to do is, um, this is what it looks like on the outside coming in. So these are these big machines that we were able to get in here. It's, that's the Piranha steel bending machine, new ventilation systems we had put in. And we have a new collision repair paint booth that we were able to put in as well. And all these are from grants, bonds, and things that allow us to keep current with technology. We have a thing called the Perkins Grant. That's a federally funded grant that allows us to be able to access funds for vocational shop programs. And that's just an example of our fields and the things that the kids did. There's a light that they helped install all these lights right here. And they did all the landscaping on the fields. It looks like an artificial turf. Because we have that landscaping and horticulture program. Oh. So they make it look mm -hmm. like it's just, um, it looks really nice when they're. Good way to get around the real wage. <laughs> one, of the exactly. things I, well, one of the things I want to show is the, you know, some of the community things that we do. We run this car show, but it's been so popular, we decided to have an open house for the families that want to see our vocational shop program so we combine the two. We also like to give back to the community from our teachers. Our teachers were able to um, do a Polar Express night. And they, you know, they have no shame in how it all looks. And um, they look really good there. They did an excellent job. And it drew 300 kids, wow. 300 little kids and their families with the intention of just giving back. It had nothing to do with our school other than we were going to house it. They had a movie night and, and it was kind of a neat way to give back. And speaking of that, let's talk about where we're at. Franklin County Technical School enrollment. As you can see in 2013, we were 476, then 478, 463, then we dropped to 437, 446, now we're back to 463. So we kind of roller coaster a little bit with our enrollment. The enrollment is sometimes, I think this drop here, as you're gonna see, is a significant decline in the regional's county enrollment. And the regional's county enrollment is here, where you had back in 2012-13, there were 806 total students, eighth graders in Franklin County. As you can see, a few short years later, it dropped down to 598. That's significant. We've never experienced that before. This yellow bar is the number of students that we enrolled during those given years. And here we are today, 143. This is a percentile of the students here. Now, you, these numbers dictate all towns. So we also have non-member towns that are part of this as well. So this just gives you an idea on where we are with enrollment and what we are projecting out forward. We already know there's 617, I mean 621 available eighth graders for next year. So we already know that. So if we just go off our average percentile and take around 22, 20 in that range, we can project out our enrollment for the next several years and have an idea how we're going to be efficient with staff and our budgets. The Frontiers enrollment increased last year and it's increasing again this year. Yeah. And, but a lot of that is school choice and a lot of that sure is, is implosions at neighboring districts and, yep. and, and I know you see yep. some of the benefits And that's that why, yeah, so us and Frontier have a benefit for very different reasons. Right. And they run an incredibly strong academic program. Does uh, the tech school have the equivalent of school choice? No. We don't have so the numbers are reflected in right. the, yeah, two right. of those yep. choices. Yep. So here's something interesting. Franklin County Tech special education students, grades nine and 10. When we compare that with all of our other member towns, these are the percentiles of special education students in the high school. 15% for Greenfield, 13 for Pioneer, 19 for Frontier, 16 for Mahar, Mohawks at 20, Turner's at 21, we're at 38.5. Mm -hmm. So we haven't been this high in a long time. The last several years we have had an influx of special education students that legally we have to serve. Therefore, we have to add. You know, it's not like it's a savings of money when your enrollment goes up if that percentile is special education. You actually have to provide the service in order to meet the needs of the child. So therefore, 
we had to be in a situation where you know we added a new special education school adjustment counselor a new special education math instructor and an, a, and a new special education vocational support person so we needed to accommodate some of the needs and i think we're going to be in a situation where we may be doing that again the following year depending on what comes through the door this next recruitment but if it's anything like the last couple of years and we get around 40 percent that come through the door that need those services when our average before that was 26 to 28 percent that's something we have to be able to address. That's a change in demographic for Franklin County Tech that we need to make sure that we're the right school for those kids, and that comes with a cost. Whoa. So I look at Conway. Here's where you guys are at. So with Conway, the enrollment in 2013, you see it's 758796. So you are about a third, you, you can expect a reduction in your assessment by about 30% this next fiscal year. So we can sit at the table and it's not a big problem. But I always like to be able to have you guys plan for the future. Mm -hmm. Currently, out of this six, four of them are graduating. So that means two will be remaining in our school. Mm -hmm. We currently have five applications. Mm -hmm. That puts us at about seven. Mm -hmm. I can project that number to go up. So I don't, it, you know, we are in the middle of the admissions process. Um, most of it happened already, but this will trickle up two or three. I could probably take a wild guess. If it stays at seven, it's fine. It, will, it very well could. I wouldn't budget for that though. I would budget for, you know, a more likely scenario. You know that that's going to probably hit. If our overall enrollment hit that two years ago at 463, when we go back two years, I'm gonna project it'd be at least nine, if not 10. You know, so your student enrollment the following year is gonna go up. So if you budget at that rate for this coming year, then you'll be in a position to recover when that goes, when that goes up so again. Can I ask about the common student number because um, I, th I know I don't know how many <laughs> kids Conway sends to Smith every year, but we're non we're a non-member town, and I believe it costs us quite a bit more to send each kid. It's dramatically more. So, and, not, and yeah. have you ever done any types of studies that you know, about why kids are choosing Smith instead of your school, and what what programs you would have to add to well, bring those kids well, in? Well, they, they, they have to they have to choose Franklin unless there's a program Franklin exactly that they want. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so right. culture. Agri so they have to change it. Um, we are in the process of moving through an approval stage where we have a proposed vet clinic on the table for next year to start a new veterinary science program. It is not, so is that a big draw at Smith? Um, they go for more, no, yeah, they go for some of the animal science and the veterinarian science, but they don't have a vet tech program per se. They're more into the animal science, but it still would pull those younger kids yeah. from going to Smith, you know, it would still pull them in that direction. So we, um, we've been thinking a lot about this over the last several years. We are now in a position to grow the program. So if it were to be approved by the state, that's one thing. If it were to be approved by our school committee, that's another thing, right? So we're still moving through all of this and we should have all of those ideas done in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. um, then we would um, have a program begin for just ninth graders in the fall of 2019. So this next fall coming up, mm -hmm. we would run it in-house for that particular year. The following year would be just ninth and 10th graders. The year after that, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Mm -hmm. And the original design would just be able to use the existing space within our building for the first year or two while our kids and our school is building a veterinarian tech clinic, which then the program will move to a new building outside, and our goal is not to have that an additional expense to the towns, because we're trying to, because we've been working on this for several years. So we are gonna be in a much better situation down the road um, with offering a program that we've got data for that supports the communities in which we live. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, a slight comment. I, I know criminal justice was something else people were going for to submit that for, but rather than try to have all of the um, tech schools provide all the curricula for everybody, I know there was some 
uh, motion in the legislature didn't get anywhere, but to reform the structure where um, uh, of, of receiving and, and taking technical schools. I'm wondering if you're aware of that effort and if you're um, following any of, any of that legislation. That was in large part due to Dean Tech um, down in Springfield, where the state had Holyoke. Dean Tech and receivership. Right, it is not applying to those uh, vocational technical schools that are self-sustaining. I, I think there was a broad effort at one point to reform the way that uh, sending and receiving happened. Uh, specifically, uh, oh, not, to, a lot of, not yes, to mandate, yes. not to mandate that towns be required to pay for um, students who were opting to go out of their region. Uh, because they wanted a program that their region didn't offer. Right. That's, I, I now remember what you're referring to. That's something that has been batted about for, you know, three or four years in a row. And it hasn't come to a conclusion. And I don't think in the last year there's been any traction on that at all. At least with the local group called MARA, that's the Massachusetts Association of Vocational Administrators. So there hasn't been any traction on that. I don't know if there will be down the road. It's something that um, I don't see it based on regional agreements and things on that nature that the schools have to abide by that are mandated by law. So there's a lot of those. There's so many big hurdles they found out about that it's kind of died down in the last year. Well, if we had um, if we had three students uh, go to an out of <coughs> district technical school. Yeah. The tuition alone would cost us a percent of our of our operating budget. Mm -hmm. Add the transportation and it could be two percent of our operating budget. So that's a substantial uh, that, that produces some substantial volatility for us that uh, I'm sure we'd like to see smoothed out. Something. Well, I would like to see that as well, you know, because you want the schools that are part of their community to grow up and be part of that community. And I think that here in Franklin County, you know, one of the reasons to help us develop a veterinary science program is to draw those kids that otherwise might have gone out of district at a large amount of cost to the towns mm -hmm. and upwards of 40 plus thousand dollars for a town like Conway. It would be in excess of that. It's, a, it's really expensive because of transportation, because of the out-of-district cost. Um, we feel rather confident that this program that we are proposing will help save a lot of our smaller towns from getting hit with that. Uh, that, that would be great. If you would like to um, mention to Mava that um, you, were the, you were the subject of, of much um, raised voices yelling and people throwing things at you because of uh, the situation that, that we wouldn't tell any, anybody anything to do. Well, they take a couple of crumbled up papers and throw it in my direction, get it on camera, I get proof. Right? <laughs> the flip side of that, though, is that that's where our farming families, you know, we, when you see that the, the list of names that, yeah. of, of, from our town that go to Smith and you see that it's 10th generation farming families that are there, yeah. you think, boy, that, they should be able to have that in this county too. They shouldn't have to go to Northampton to continue yeah. the family, family farm. You're feeding the fire over here. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what I've been trying to preach for a while. Yes. How's um, the new program, the vet program that you were talking about? You said there's no cost to the towns. Yeah, we don't anticipate going out to have our towns add an additional assessment. An additional cost. They'll, right. they'll still charge right. the kids. Right. I mean the I mean the case. What, setting up this program and setting up this building. Yeah. How is it funded then? We've been we've been playing this for years through you know money that we've been able to uh, accumulate through capital expenses and things like that. Um, so we've been able to look at this as a long term plan, and we are going to move forward with it with our students doing a lot of the labor as well. So that's going to, you know, it's just, you know, getting it started. It's not going to be this big, glamorous, expensive project. We're looking at a steel building to get started with it. And as the program grows, we have the, the availability to grow that. Yeah. So if we need to grow the small steel building yeah, we'll yeah, start yeah. off with, yeah. 
then we can grow it and grow it and grow it. So we don't want to start big. We're going to start very manageable, very small, for not a lot of money, comparably speaking. Mm -hmm. where, where do you where do you find that um, your your curriculum demand is changing? For uh, you know, what what are students demanding more in terms of programs? Um, it's the core areas have been strong. When I say core areas of the vocational technical program, when you look at electrical and plumbing and carpentry and the, landscaping. The standard trades. Those have been yeah. our foundation of our school and those have been very strong. Those are the individuals that when they get out, they know how to build a house, they know how to start their mm -hmm. own company. And often, and our exit data says this, they go back and they start their own businesses and they stay in the town they came from. Now, you know, five years later, they're paying taxes back to that town mm -hmm. and they're becoming a member of the community. Not everybody, but a larger than average percentage are going back to their towns and paying taxes and building companies. So that's, ex that, that's exciting. So along with your, your basic core, yeah. you're giving them some business training as well as some entrepreneurial training? Absolutely. We have... Um, we do soft skills training. They get handshake assignments, as you know, based on yeah. They get interviewing assignments, resume building. We get them out on internships and co-ops, so they're really connected. By the time they get out, they have a strong connection with the communities. Great. Okay. So the picture you saw earlier of the welding program, <laughs> the state is throwing money at manufacturing. Right. So our our core program, Franklin County, still the core programs. Like Rick said, you know, carpentry, electrical. I think we're looking at maybe yeah. potentially expanding to another instructor or doing a, something a little bit different with electrical. So we got still got high demand. State funding is coming, and they're throwing grants out there. So the grant that Rick got for the welding program, and similarly, we got uh, several years ago a half a million dollar grant for the machine technology program, the machinist program. So the state's throwing the funding there. We're, we're still seeing. The, the student enrollment over here in the core stuff. We're trying to attract them. All the parents want their students over here in manufacturing because that's where the huge shortage in Massachusetts and the United States right. is. So you've got, <laughs> but not to say that I, we, we've got electricians going out working for Western Mass Electric as linemen. I mean, we've got a lot of things going on, but the state seems to be throwing money at some of those based on what their fancy is. We're trying to fund some of the others and enhance our manufacturing. So that's why Rick kind of highlighted that because that was the latest and greatest that the state threw money at. Do you still have a waiting list? We never had one. You, you don't? No, nope, we still don't have one. I thought you did. No, there's no waiting list. Every qualified student has been accepted into our program. The waiting list has started when qualified students can't get in. Right now we haven't had that. So that's why you see the fluctuation yeah. in, in our enrollment. You're thinking of the charter. The good news there is that Desi turned down Pioneer Valley, uh, the, uh, the uh, Chinese, 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 uh, Chinese um, yeah, the expansion. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, um, and I'm going to turn the rest of this over to Russ. If you want to take it from here. So for annual assessments, so if we want to start kind of crunching numbers <laughs> okay. a little bit, um, the October one count, like Rick showed you on a graph earlier, was six students for Conway. So this is our formula for our assessments to our member towns. Minimum contribution, the very, one of the first columns on the left of the formula just came out in the governor's budget. So that's how, that's how I could start to calculate what our town's assessments are going to be. As the budget changes, minimum contributions may or may not change from the state. That's always one caveat. And again, our school committee hasn't approved our budget. So what you're seeing up here is a guesstimate of what we think as administrators that uh, $112,000 assessment to Conway will be. The focus got a little worse when you pull this back. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, that, says, that says our town is the highest assessment per pupil of any town. That's your town is. It's, no, it's the well, highest. you're right up there with um, Lyden. So there's. There's a bunch of towns in that area. So there's, um, I can scroll here. There's Deerfield, Irving, there's Lyden. There's Waitley, uh, there's a few others that are right in there. 18,000, 
per pupil. Why the variation? Why twelve? Why, that's a huge. That's a huge spread. Eleven thousand to eighteen something. Welcome to the education mm -hmm. reform formula of 1993. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was worse. It was worse. Yeah. We yeah. had a member of the Department of Ed here in Conway 10, 12 years ago or whatever, Roger Hatch, because Conway was at over 20 grand a student. Yeah, we were. The town of Irving was $4,000 a student. I remember one year was, we had six kids, 150,000, it was 25,000 per kid. Same year Gill was 3,000. Yeah. Oh, Gill, maybe Gil. it was Gill. Yeah. Right, and I remember like, Gill was 3,000 wow. students. So that was the 93 Ed Reform formula. Then about 12, 13 years later, they another Supreme Court case rolled through. They streamlined the formula to where it is today. And now you're hearing about a new foundation formula that the governor plugged into his budget and hopefully that moves through legislators and becomes law that'll help smooth some of these things so, out. But you're, you're considered, so you're, where you're at, you're considered one of the wealthy communities in Massachusetts. So you're paying the same as pick uh, 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 one of the big towns on the eastern part of the state. So yeah. they get Wellesley. 80 through Wellesley, there yeah, you go. Yeah, so, so they, you got, say, they say numbers don't lie, but I'm here to say these, so, these so, numbers are lying through the damn So you get 17.5% of your foundation yeah. help is from the state, 82.5% and you pay with your local taxes, just like Wellesley does and, and yeah. you know, the Long Meadows and those places. So mm -hmm. we have a handful of communities, believe it or not, out here in Western Mass that they consider in that in that yeah. same group. Yeah. Um, but then on the other side, I get the poorer communities going, well, geez, those rich guys like Conway should be paying, they shouldn't be getting any state aid because we need more. So you get, you get the pushback from both, both ends of the, of the spectrum. Um, and that's why the, the, such a struggle to fix the formula. But that'll give you at least a, a little rough estimate. I will get a hold of the town administrators as mm -hmm. we vote, oh, as we vote, um, the once my school committee votes so after my february public hearing even though it's still not a final vote but at least i'll i'll feel more comfortable publishing something out on email or to you what, guys. what's the date yeah it is the second wednesday of february so i think the 13th or something so like that the, the thing the thing that um that i've always noticed just from looking at the the annual comparative budget documents from the various schools in the county is that uh that franklin tech always sort of is the highest in the administrative cost per student. Um, that, that you have a school that's what, less than two thirds the size of Frontier, that your administrative- Well, not, not high school. We're the biggest high school in Franklin County. Right, seven through 12 versus nine through 12. But, yeah. um, but that you, you have, you're, the cost to administer, because you, you, you have the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, principal, assistant principal. Not exactly. Not exactly? No. Do you have an assistant business manager? No, no. We get no assistant superintendent. Um, no. We get the building principal that would have both titles. A lot of people got both titles, you know. Which our building principal is also our curriculum director. Um, so you know they have multiple titles. So we are, we fit in average with the county. We got to our administrative cost at the grades nine through twelve, and we actually run two schools. So we're running the vocational school as one component. That's a federally funded type of program and we run our academic school. So our students still have to have the same MCAS school right. as all the other schools. And so we have to run that school and they do it in half the time. Because every other week they're in their vocational shop, the next week they're in their academic area. So they have a full week not in their academic area. So instead of 180 days, all the other kids get to pass their MCAS, our kids get 90. And yet our schools are right in the middle of the pack of all of Franklin County. So we're actually running two schools. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and the what well, you may be thinking is a handful of years ago <coughs> when I reported, so it's all on how you report your numbers to the state, a lot of it. So when I reported our numbers to the state at the time, this was probably five, six years ago, we had a technology director that we considered part of our administrative team. So that was in our administrative costs. I know the other schools in Franklin County didn't, didn't view that position as an administrative position and they put it somewhere else in there. That's well, the same exact budget. position. We just but it was just right. how it was reported mm -hmm. out. 
So, but that's been corrected since then. We don't do that. I, we actually, our technology director is not part of our administrative team anymore. Right. So we kind of put that person into middle management and uh, moved on from there. Okay. Do you have any idea what your transportation costs are going to be doing, leveling or going up? Transportation is going up. Okay. So all of the county schools except <coughs> Mohawk went out on its own. Mahar Frontier's out on its own. Has We're not part of that either. Oh yes, you are. Frontier. No, Frontier. You've got. Um, you're right. Rico. Pioneer. I get you two guys <laughs> mixed up. Pioneer is with us. Frontier. You guys have Gripco. So Frontier's got Gripco. Good deal there. Same with Orange and Mahar. Good deal there. Uh, for us, we went out to bid with the four other county schools: Greenfield, Pioneer, Gil Montague, and the Irving uh, School Union. And we've got a bus contract, a bus bid that has come in. It is about 9% higher than the outgoing contract. Mm -hmm. The outgoing contract, they had, we had a fuel de-escalator because at the time that they bid the contract, fuel was high, <coughs> it has dropped ste steadily since. And we had a cost of living adjustment in that contract that the contractor feels was unfair, although it was the consumer price index for the Northeast region that we indexed it to a popular index but so we are in the midst of getting some sticker shock on the next next transportation contract last time we bid it out five years before that we had a 12 percent jump in that first year so i, I guess if there's anything to be optimistic about it's only a nine percent jump this time did this two, time but did, it's did the two main bidders submit almost identical bids again we no. so we had so last time we went out, again, you, you guys were you know, taken care of by Gripco, so you, you better hope that family operation stays going. Just put, that's just the greatest put deal. Again that's this week. the greatest deal. And we can't get them to bid it on ours. Last, time, last two times we bid, so every five years, so five and ten years ago, um, we basically had one bidder. We had one bid, one company, one of the national companies come in with an envelope, but never passed it in. I think they were there to intimidate and never passed the bid. This time we had two bids. We had a bidder, our Kismeskis bus, the, the uh, current contractor, and a contractor from Brookfield, Mass, another family operation, which I was hoping was going to be competitive. They came in at $440 per bus per day. Kismeskis came in at $393 per bus per day, but it's up from what we're currently paying is $365 per bus per day, so it's mm -hmm. jump. I talked to the company who sells buses to the bus companies, because he's at the bid, because he wants to know who he's going to be selling buses to next year, mm -hmm. and he said even on the eastern part of the state, they're having trouble getting more than the incumbent to bid on it because labor, they're all struggling to get bus drivers, mm -hmm. and you get from mid-state to east, real estate. Because you've got to have sure. a big chunk of land for yeah. a, bus yeah. <laughs> a bus garage. So he's saying, yeah. unless, you have, unless you go out for a 15 to 20 year contract, you're probably not going to get any big player swooping in, because it's going to take them at least 10 years, if not longer, to get their initial investment. Sure. That on the books. You must have kept oh, that book. <laughs> do you have um, do you have the assessments for transportation? We'll get to that okay. screen. Well, okay. the assessment for us is all it's all baked into one assessment for the operating oh, assessment. Oh, okay. Transportation is part of our operating assessment. So, well, that our, so that's part of so the your, your assessment is going to go down. Yeah, a couple screens. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's part of the two twelve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right, correct. Okay, good. So no matter what we're doing, uh, as, as far as feeling pain on that. Conway won't, your student enrollment drop. Right. Our assessments in total to all our towns went up 2.8%. Um, so that's the average. Yours goes down because of the number of pupils, but if you average it across our 19 towns, it went up 2.8%. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep it below like your municipal revenue growth factors in the fours. Um, the inflation factor that the state uses on, on some of the stuff is in the threes. So we try to stay below. Um, some of those indexes at least when we, when we try. For capital assessments this coming year, we're gonna have on the debt service schedule $160,000. So Conway's share of the capital assessment will be 5,315.70. The capital assessment is a luxury that Frontier does not have. The, the operating agreement with the Frontier Towns only provides for ordinary 
for all, all, all assessments to be classified as ordinary. However, if, if, when Frontier rebuilt their school, they had a capital that's assessment. The only thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's what this is. We uh, we right. we did not have the like we we were late at the dance. Every other school in the county, maybe because we were built in the 70s and they were built prior to that, but every other school in the county has either renovated or rebuilt their high schools. We're sitting with an older asset. So what the state did in the MSBA, as far as the school building <laughs> authority to give us loans, allowed us a windows, roof, right? windows yeah. and doors roof. And, and so we're just trying to maintain that. so we don't have to go out to these big, huge renovations. So mm -hmm. you know, if we can take yeah. care of our building, we really help our towns out that way too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then here's um, just proof that I know how to balance a budget. So on one page, top of the page is all our funding sources equals 11,643. And at the bottom of the page, oops, <laughs> bottom of the page, uses of fundings or appropriations, 11,643. Magically balances. If the rent a firm from Frontier comes up and gives you any more complicated <laughs> of a budget than this, then send them back and have them do it again because of budgets for schools are a very simple thing that can be put on one page mm -hmm. and um, figured out quite easy. Um, budgeting in this time for Frontier and all of us is the easiest it's ever been because we're all stuck in the hold, hold harmless mode of Chapter 70. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to budget what we're going to get for Chapter 70. Is you look at the money that came in the previous year, that's the money you're going to get next year, and they may throw you a bone like $20 per student, which is what the <laughs> governor threw in his budget. So pretty easy to, to make up your major funding sources. Burden ends up and with the towns for the most part. Uh, I felt feel we've been very fair with our towns. I did a 22 year average because that's how long I've been at Franklin County Tech on um, assessments to towns. We've averaged about 3.2 percent increase to our towns over the 22 years. Mm -hmm. So we've been pretty steady. Not no high crazy increases in a few years with zeros, but you know, nothing less. Uh, so that gives you a feel for. What we've got, Rick gave you a feel for what we're doing as far as program-wise. Mm -hmm. Got a few little fancy charts. The Pac-Man chart here just shows you the blue is town local help, local assessments to us. That's kind of eating up the pie, whereas the states, the red pieces, the state's been shrinking over the years. So mm -hmm. governor's budget will help us grow a little bit in our chapter 70 this coming year, but that'll be the first time in the you know, four, four or five years that we've actually seen more of an increase. So we, we might peak out of hold harmless um, in the governor's budget if that holds true. So we're, we're cautiously optimistic for next year's mm -hmm. um, yeah. budget. And then the expenditure appropriation part of the budget just goes, the red is basically uh, instructional services. So we are a labor intensive industry. So most of our, the pie up there represents different pieces of personnel mm -hmm. um, in our particular situation. And that is it, kind okay. of it in a nutshell. It will be more official, like I said, I can get yeah. uh, more information out in February when we get a final. Yeah, we got our first meeting in February and then our voted budget happens in March. Okay. So we have, uh, you know, for what you saw here will probably be our first meeting. And then after that, we will go for a final vote in March, and then we go out to the town meetings to be able to um, secure the budget. Right. Any other questions? When do you close uh, enrollment in the school? We have an open enrollment, and the enrollment does usually close at the end of July. So uh, I'm, waiting, I'm wondering what happens when we set our budget and then you except three more kids from town. Well, yours is locked into the this past October 1's count. So that enrollment, as far as next year's budget, is already locked in. I guess. So, yeah. yeah, so the next time. So, but like Rick but said, we will see students out. come. I'm trying to say, for, yeah. you know, so right. right now, you're locked in at six. There's your assessment's gonna be down about 30% yeah. from yeah. the previous year. And some of the towns that are down in their assessment try to budget for what is a higher year they've had before. So they're not surprised if it does go. It could stay the same. It could only be seven students next year. I wouldn't budget like that personally. I would probably budget for ten and, and then see how that goes. It's not like we save money because it costs us to send them to Frontier too. Right. 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 So, so you just you know, 
Um, they don't go to you, they go to Frontier. Right. right. The net right. school spending oh. cost per Four. pupil yeah. for Frontier is approaching Franklin County tax costs. Yes. And traditionally, yeah. you see an academic school yeah. about seven to ten grand less than a vocational school. Yeah. Frontier is yeah. almost yeah. at. Um, You're right, that's 20, a great 000. point. So, you know, Peter to pay Paul, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. How many students are in the uh, CNC program now? We have um, we have a cap according to what we've been doing on a one to twelve teacher ratio for all grade levels. So in our CNC advanced precision machining, that would be about forty eight students. So we would be anywhere between forty and forty eight, depending on the grade level. Okay. And our total. And then we have the other um, shop program I showed you with the manufacturing for you know um, that brand new machine we got mm -hmm. in the CNC welding one. shop. Uh -huh. So that's turning into a CNC machine shop uh -huh. as well because that's uh -huh. where technology is starting to go. Uh -huh. So that shop um, just filled up because of all this new machinery. So it, it has a lot of enthusiasm on yeah. the part of the kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has there been a foundation? Is it still just a foundation to help buy CNC equipment? So we had a uh, foundation for the advanced precision machining. We are in um, discussion about a general foundation for all of our shop programs so we can keep them up to speed, but we don't have that set up yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you still get workforce training grants for, for uh, non-traditional students to go uh, take courses in CNC and other skills? Yes. Now that's our evening program. It's called the Middle Skills Machining Initiative. Over the last six years, we've had 135 students graduate from the program with 90% job placement. All right. Wonderful. Does and it help off offset some of the expenses of the school? Or is that um, it's kind of a wash. It doesn't offset it. It's just, you know, it's trying to give back. I think that's really the big um, focus because if you can get these people employed, well, what are they doing? They're going back to their town, they're paying taxes, and they're basically paying for themselves, you know, through that time frame. So if they're able to get a job and they can pay taxes and go back to their towns, Everybody wins, so we try to provide that service. That's the argument for education spending in general. Yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. best argument oh, yeah. there is. And it happens, like we get to see it, which yeah. is fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Gentlemen, thank you for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Tom, do you have uh, any other comments on uh, the town meeting? Yeah, I just had uh, a couple of things to say. One is, um, I had tremendously over budgeted for property and liability insurance and for workers' comp insurance. Um, and that was based on just being scared about some uh, some of the claims that we had. I just met with the Maya insurance agent and I just chopped like $13,000 out of that budget. Uh, so it's um, down to 73000 now from 86. Um, there's been a long, a long-standing over budgeting, but the uh, fluctuations are not as much um, as I thought they might be. And this year we're doing fine. So it's a three-year rolling average that we take, and we have not been doing as badly as I feared we were doing. So um, that was a that was a satisfying chunk to chop off. Um, and the other thing is. I'm sorry. That was the Lucas thing. <laughs> um, and the other thing is uh, that even though we're not spending, we're not raising and appropriating any money in the in the uh, money articles in the warren. It's all from existing funds or free cash. It's all from existing funds. Uh, we still may be challenged. Uh, in our levy limit. It depends on what uh, Frontier and the Conway Grammar School come in with numbers. It's great to hear the number tonight. Um, that is substantially less. That's $100,000 less than, uh, over $100,000 less than I had budgeted based on what uh, last year was. I had added just 5% to last year. So aside from that, um, I mean, that, 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 gives us, that gives me a lot more confidence. Uh, still, if they come in much more than five percent, you know, there's such a huge chunk of the budget that uh, we could be back up there uh, closer past our levy limit again. I, I can estimate comfortably that say that that's unlikely at this point. Really, for the frontier operating budget to be 
More than 5%? Yeah, is unlikely. Good. Do you have any idea about Conway? Uh, I would put that in very unlikely. Looking good for the budget. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you were there at that, that about 5% just based on what we saw looks, looks unlikely for Conway Grammar, for sure. Okay. Looks okay, really good. unlikely. Okay. Good. Well, we like conservative budgeting. Okay. So. Uh, any other comments, Tom? No. Okay. Uh, we have an item non anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Chief, you want to come up and tell us about this? Are you on the finance committee now, huh? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> See how fast he got out of that chair? <laughs> no more, no finance for me. Um, what I'm here for is that uh, we have been getting a lot of calls for more details already this year, mm -hmm. which is early. Mm -hmm. um, I know Eversource is going to be replacing 33 poles on Shelton Fall Road. And lining up details has not been the easiest thing. I spent yeah. four hours today trying to line up details just for tomorrow. And what I found is a lot of the towns that are surrounding us have all gone up on their rates to follow the state rates. We have now, traditionally in the past. But Buckland, Shelburne, Charlemont, Ashfield, Waitley, and Hatfield, and I talked to Deerfield. Deerfield does not necessarily have a policy to follow the state rate. They merely do. So to make it simple, in fact, I called the Sheriff's Department today, two women for officers, and was unable to go. And I think what happens is a lot of them go to the towns with the higher rates sure. to follow the sure. state rate. Yeah. Um, Did, didn't we didn't we increase the rate two or three years ago from like 38 to 42? Yes. We, we went up to, we went up to 42 to 45. Oh, for, oh we, we went up 42 yeah. to 45. But everybody else is in 50. Okay. Okay. okay, so, so that 38 to 42 must have been six years ago. Yeah. Okay, so now now 50 is the 50 state. 50 is the state rate, and that's what okay. all the other surrounding towns are. All right, so we're we're, so we're competing because uh, we're having trouble because we're lower than everybody else. Right. Okay. So basically, I'm looking for the board just to say stay with the state rate. Okay. Um, that's what the other towns are all doing. Uh, what what effect do you, do you think that's going to have budget wise between now and the end of the year? Um, it doesn't affect our budget at all. These are all rates that are paid all by IT. Yes. Ah, okay. So actually, the town does get the revenue from this. Okay, um, all right. If it's a state contract, we get nothing. Uh, okay. It doesn't cost us anything, we don't get anything. But if it's a private vendor, we get 10%. Okay. So you're selling it pretty well. Uh, the town gets 10% of what you get? Yeah. Oh, well, why do you gotta stop at 50? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> What's the downside? <laughs> Okay, so there's no effect on our budget, not at all. So why do you? No, seriously, why do you have to stop at fifty? Um, I am not going to go higher than no, the state rate. No, no, sure. Well, <laughs> no. if we get ten percent and somebody else is paying for it, all right. well then they'll they'll ask for someone else to fill the details. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll make a motion that we we uh, follow the recommendation of our police chief and we raise the rate for uh, providing for details here in town to the state rate of 50 years. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Chief, thank yep. you for coming in. Um, why don't we just do it February 1st? Um, we can do it. You want to do it right now? We'll do it right now. Okay. Effective right now. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Easy labor increase over the city. <laughs> Thank you. Revenue increase. Revenue, Revenue okay. increase. Okay. Tom, you have an update for us? Yes, I do. In committee news, the Garage Facility Committee is almost ready to propose an article for funding the design for the proposed highway facility. They're planning to use some funds left over from the last project to hire the FERCOG to manage a request for qualifications for an owner's project manager to be able to give town meeting a hard figure for that cost. Uh, the design cost would still have to be estimated. So what we would do is we would advertise contingent on funding. 
And that means we might not get uh, the best um, designers, but we would have a hard number. So that's the trade-off. Um, we would probably get someone who is entirely competent, but um, some, some firms might, might not want to bid contingent on funding. Uh, so then the, the article for the funding of the design would include a number for the overall cost, or an estimate of the overall cost? We get the estimate for the overall cost from the design. That's what design, the design does. Uh, and one of the, the major purposes of getting a design is to get a cost estimate, which is, which is uh, checked by the owner's project manager. So, I mean, because this was the one where Andrea, the uh, Buckland town manager, was talking, and I had to leave right in the seat, but, and, and the question was asked of her, um, can we do, do it where all the numbers are presented at once? And she said yes, and then I had to leave. So, I, I, but I don't know whether... She's talking about the final vote. You get the cost from the design. If you don't have a design, you can't estimate the cost. You, can, you don't know the cost. So the, the number you get from the design is what you bid with the bid documents that des the designer comes up with you for, comes up for with you, and that's what you bring to town meeting. That's where you have the final project number. That's the purpose of the design is to generate that number. Mm -hmm. As well as the Because it, the cost depends on the design. All right, so the, that gets built into the bid documents that are also part of the design. Is the committee meeting again before the they're proposing an article or writing drafting an article? Oh yeah, yeah, they're meeting tomorrow night. Wait, six o'clock town office. Oh good, okay. Save my um, questions for that then. Yeah. Due to a post, the capital improvement planning committee did not meet on Wednesday, January twenty third. The chair is aware that the committee's report is expected February 11th. Um, he also indicated that he did not feel the committee is currently constituted was capable of taking on the task of capital planning. It seems we should consider recruiting others for the work. Wait, the capital planning committee says they can't capital plan. <laughs> that was the opinion of the chair. That, that was the opinion of the capital planning to, committee. To me. Well, of the, of the chair as expressed to me. Um, I, th I spoke with another member who was not sure that that was entirely what, how he felt. Um, in departmental news, I have in the past been able to present a proposed budget around the last week in February. I may or may not be able to do that this year. In the past, our utilities have regularly submitted their personal property values to the assessors well in advance of their deadline of March 1st. However, not only is this not guaranteed, but I will be at a procurement class most of the last week of February. Normally, I would have submitted the budget before then, but if the utilities are later than usual in getting us their figures, I may not have the budget ready till early March. So that may be a week. So what, all, um, what do they consist of? The, the dam? You know, what, per, what utility personal property? Um, we're most interested in Comcast. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm checking with town council about several matters related to taxing Airbnb operations. Uh, first, I believe uh, that any action the town would take would cover existing and permitted bed and breakfast operations as well as Airbnb operations, the real object of the article, and have asked if he concurs. Second, I've asked whether setting the town rate really needs town meeting approval or whether it is just a select board action now that town meeting has accepted the statute? Mm -hmm. And if so, can the board set different rates for permitted B&Bs versus unpermitted Airbnb operations? Those were some questions so I had. So those are good questions. Does he respond in writing? He has not responded yet. But do you expect the response in writing? Yes. Oh, sure. So could you send yes. that out? Oh, yes. <laughs> The Attorney General has approved <coughs> excuse me, the town's marijuana establishment bylaw with the following caveat. 
which resulted from a motion to amend the planning board proposal on the floor of town meeting. <coughs> Section 115F of the bylaw states that permitting priority will be granted to organic cultivation. It is unclear what the town intended by this text. Since organic cultivation is not a criterion for a grant of a special permit, and since the town does not establish a limit on the number of cultivators, it is unclear whether the town intended to authorize the planning board as the special permit granting authority to deny a special permit if organic cultivation methods are not used. As drafted, the text quoted above may grant undue discretion to the special permit granting authority. Um, so they just have to be careful not to make it a, a criterion rather than a preference. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, preferred over what? We don't have a limit on the number of, of establishments. So I think that was uh, one of the questions the Attorney General had. So can, I mean, the Planning Board might choose to address those comments with another with an addition to the bylaw. I mean, it seems like if, if, if their intent was to make that mandatory, then, uh, then, it, then that, it, it was not their intent. This right, was a right. motion on town meeting yeah. floor. But if they want to address so, it, time's, time's a ticking. My own uh, opinion is that um, since it was a motion from the, from the town meeting floor, the planning board is, is not in a hurry either to make a big deal about it um, in their special permitting process or to make it a priority for their bylaw development. I know they have other things <coughs> in mind uh, and their own agenda for creating more bylaws. Uh, and finally, we have received a report from the Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority for a regional community development block grant for the quarter ending at the, the, the for the quarter ending at the end of December 2018. Two Conway housing units completed their rehab one is under construction and two are in the application process. So we do get regular reports from them. If anyone wants to see the details, I have those back at the office. Great. Thank you, Tony. Okay, select board comments. Any comments from select board members? No? no. Commented out. Okay. We have no mail tonight. We have one announcement. Uh, a community outreach meeting for a proposed marijuana establishment is scheduled for Saturday. Um, February 2nd, 7 p.m. at the Conway Town Hall, 5 Academy Hill Road, Conway. That's right here, probably in this room. Right, Thomas? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the proposed cultivation and manufacturing uh, marijuana establishment is anticipated to be located at 1230 uh, Main Poland Road, Conway. There will be an opportunity for the public to ask questions. Okay. And note that that says cultivation and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's no more. So this is this is also in the town website, I assume. That, that yes. notice yeah. about this yeah. and mm -hmm. and is it yeah. in the recorder? It will be. It, uh, I think it may have been all. Yeah, it should have been. I think I saw on, it. On. Yeah, it was. I think it was in already. I think yeah. it, it was supposed to be in on Saturday. I think it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's on the board in front of uh, the town office. And bakers and post office and library. Great. Okay, if there's no more uh, business to come before the board, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting is uh, February 4th. Um, Could, before we adjourn, there's one thing just about calendar. So um, I missed last Tuesday because when I was doing all the calendar I, calendars, I, I missed Mar MLK holiday. But... Can we do a schedule, whatever our schedule is, and then vote? Just because I'm, I'm having to schedule things three months in advance, and, and I'm always now nervous about missing a holiday or just missing our day. And um, can, I'm not saying like immediate, but, at, but can we just develop a habit where we're doing a schedule long term or months in advance and then voting on it and posting it and, so that, because um, I don't, uh, that, that mistake was like mostly my fault, but it's also just the way the, the because I didn't have the, like a long-term schedule that I was working off of to put this in. So I, I would just like to, if we can, just do a scheduling that just, sure. just like months in advance so that I don't miss them in the future. 
Well, it's every Monday night unless it's a holiday then it's Tuesday. Exactly, but those holidays are tricky, you know. They sneak up and on you. And there's more coming up. Yeah, they sneak up on you. Okay. You know. Time. They're not well documented. They're not well, documented. They're not well enough documented for me. Yeah, I think you need a second on your motion. Okay, yeah, we need a second. Second, second. Second. All right, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.